coli certainly has, has been a challenge. I, I would say, or back up a little bit and say, you know, over the years, what my experience has been is, is E. coli has been kind of a constant challenge over the 20 years that I've been out. Um, there's years where we don't see, you know, a big problem, but then we'll have spikes um, that, uh, that certainly affect nursery mortality. And, and we're in one of those spikes right now, the last three to four years, uh, seeing quite a bit of E. coli in nurseries across several client herds. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me in our illustrious podcast studios this week is Dr. Brad Lewerke. Dr. Lewerke is a veterinarian and partner at Swine Vet Center in St. Peter, Minnesota. Dr. Lewerke, thank you so much for coming on the show. Brad, I know you know lots of folks in the industry, but just in case there's somebody out there that hasn't had the pleasure of meeting you, why don't you start with a little introduction and some background? Sure. Thanks, Clayton, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, Brad Lewerke, I'm a, a veterinarian at Swine Vet Center in, uh, in St. Peter, Minnesota, um, an Iowa State grad uh, in 2006. And I spend a lot of my time working with a variety of swine producers uh, here in the Midwest, um, on a variety of sizes of operations and, and health concerns that they, that they would have uh, day to day. A full value relationship starts with understanding your business and Alanco knows growing the healthiest pig requires focus on every segment of production. Through continuous innovation, trusted solutions and actionable insights, Alanco is invested in helping you achieve the full value of every decision. Their portfolio offers solutions that manage disease challenges, minimize variation, and mitigate mortality to optimize pig health. Get full value from start to finish with Elanco. Well, and as a fellow practicing veterinarian, I can share your, your pain and some disease challenges that we see commonly across producers, right? There's some cheap disease challenges that uh, they pester everybody, whether you're doing antibiotic free production or or quite the opposite you're you know you're raising genetic stock and e coli is one of those um brad i know that you have uh, uh, probably a lot of experience with e coli and it's generally a situation where we have to use multiple strategies to get control of what we want let's start brad with um for e coli um what's kind of in your toolbox if 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 i got a nursery and i'm having a problem with e coli and i call you up and say doc lewerke what should I be trying to do? What are the different things I need to apply to try and make the pigs healthier? Yeah, and, and E. coli certainly is, has been a challenge. I, I would say, or back up a little bit and say, you know, over the years, what my experience has been is, is E. coli has been kind of a constant challenge over the 20 years that I've been out. Um, there's years where we don't see, you know, a big problem, but then we'll have spikes um, that, uh, that certainly affect nursery mortality. And, and we're in one of those spikes right now the last three to four years uh, seen quite a bit of E. coli in nurseries across several client herds. And when I get that call or when we're talking through with clients on, on E. coli control, you know, to me, number one is, is barn sanitation and, and trying to just uh, reduce the amount of E. coli challenge that those pigs see when they come into the nursery. But um, that's usually not enough. And so other things that we talk about, um, uh, water medication strategies, uh, e. coli vaccine, all all early on to try and prevent uh, those bad breaks from happening. And then, you know, in some of those bad nursery cases where it just continues to come back, uh, more than just wash and disinfect, things like flaming, flaming slats, flaming water cups, uh, disinfecting water lines. Um, it, it, we have a wide variety of, of uh, cleaning protocols that we put together to just try and combat just the the buildup of E. coli uh, in, in the nursery environment. And I think it's a reality that uh, E. coli is ubiquitous, right? You and I are both infected with E. coli as we speak. All the pigs that we're going to see are infected with E. coli. So it's not something we can biosecurity our way out of necessarily or, or have eradicated herds. So to that end, there's always going to be situations where the control gets away from us a little bit, whether it's an individual pig or a population of pigs. And it's a bacteria, so presumably antibiotics are one of the gold standards of therapy. Um, uh, as you think about antibiotic options for E. coli, Brad, what kind of goes through your mind and what do you talk to producers about? Yeah, great question. I, I would say that from a water standpoint, we're, we're fairly limited on, on the antibiotics that are available that combat E. coli. And 
And, you know, as veterinarians, we have a little bit of flexibility to, um, you know, as we see fit or needed on, on those antibiotics uh, to use those. Um, uh, but again, fairly limited on, on what we have. Uh, from a feed standpoint, kind of the same is true. We've only got a couple options per label to um, to use, and and most of those I would say are more preventative than than treating a group of sick pigs. So we implement those as um, a way to we know a site or a flow or a, a herd is going to break with E. coli at a certain point, and so we have those in place to again try to to pre- prevent that break or at least. Uh, reduce it to a point where it's manageable through the other treatment um, options that we've got. Any uh, specific strategies that you've got in mind out there to share with uh, producers, Brad, either on the prevention or the treatment side? If they're they're feeling like it's not working today, what are some uh, specific things that you highlight for them? Well, particularly from a, from a feed standpoint, one that, uh, um, uh, that I've used, and, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of background um, on Cavalt. Um, you know, early on when that, uh, when that was available, uh, to, to producers, we were excited. We thought we had a, a new tool in the toolbox that could knock E. coli out. And, and, um, I would say early on in my hands, at least, uh, we saw a good impact when pigs were eating cavalt, like we didn't have E. coli, but, um, but shortly after it was, it was pulled off, they transitioned to the next diet. Um, then we'd see a, a spike back in E. coli and, and often got the, um, feedback from supervisors, producers that really didn't change it much. We just pushed E. coli uh, further in th- into the nursery. And I would say, you know, one of the things that we found uh, over time uh, with that and learned from those those early mistakes is that uh, I think in something like Cavalt, duration matters. So we've got a label of 21 to 42 days uh, on that on that product. And I was always trying to use it the shortest amount of time possible, but longer duration uh, trying to get pigs through that critical time where E. coli is is probably the the biggest risk, and then um, trying to um, have cavalt end when it does end, uh, not be on a on a diet transition. I think one I think one of the things that we saw early on is um, when we talk about nursery diets, um, whether it be zinc, whether it be just the ingredients in those diets, there's some pretty drastic changes that that affect the gut, and so if we're pulling cavalt plus we're making a diet transition. I think that's why we see E. coli spike back. And so as we've refined the duration um, and those diets to allow uh, Cavalt to end, not on a, on a diet transition, that's been, that's been uh, quite good for E. coli control. And when you say diet transition, Brad, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I know a lot of people may be thinking about, well, that's nursery two to nursery three, right? Something like that. But I think what you're saying is ignore the names of the rations. What we're talking about is the the formulation. So think of it instead of like phase three and phase four, we're talking about 3A and 3B. And 3A may still have Cavalt in there. And then we transition to 3B because we've got to get off of it to go within the label uh, timeline. Uh, But 3B has the exact same formulation of everything but Cavalt for the pig. Is that that a fair way to put it? Yep, and that's a great explanation of what we've done. We've tried to in in those, those herds where we're using Cavalt for E. coli control, um, we've we've designed the diet so yes, uh, diet two A and B or diet three A and B, the cavalt ends when three A ends, but then three B is the same formulation without cavalt. Yep. Try to uh, push that stress out to another time where they don't have to go through the stress of losing the antibiotic support and lose and having the stress of a different formulation uh, the, at the same time. What about benefits, Brad? Like, uh, what what would you tell a producer is reasonable to expect from a prevention or a treatment standpoint if they've got E. coli and they're looking at Cavalt as an option? I'd say, um, obviously, depends on the severity of, of E. coli challenge um, in that herd or flow or site. Um, the the work that we've done on on Cavalt recently, looking at that very question compared to control diets uh, without Cavalt, um, we've seen you know a, a half to, um, to uh, 75% less mortality related to E. coli in a, in a severe challenge. Now, again, that's a, that's a case where E. coli is causing 10% nursery mortality. So we've seen a dramatic impact there. I think when E. coli is less severe, um, that, that, that benefit probably um, less dramatic. But, but even in those cases where, you know, we've got mild E. coli challenges, 
uh, we've seen the same impact when when we do the diet right and do the duration right. Um, we noticeably impact E. coli mortality, um, and we also, um, as kind of a side benefit, because again, what I see with E. coli is it doesn't completely prevent. So, and label would indicate it's not a prevention; it's control of E. coli. But what we see on on pigs um, that are on those diets, at least the E. coli that when it's there, when it's moving through, it's more manageable through some of the other injectable water strategies that we put in place normally with a, an E. coli break. How about timing, Brad, for a producer that wants to get that maximum benefit that's available to them? Does it depend on when they're seeing the E. coli signs? So the best timing for each producer is different or no, it, it really is kind of important at this stage in the piglet's development to get started here. So even if you're seeing the signs early or late, you still use kind of the same time for all producers. It would uh, it would be very dependent on when the break is happening. So what we found is that uh, um, no E. coli break is is the same. Although we get flows that it's pretty predictable and we can time that right. But our best luck is when we've got cavalt in place before the break is going to happen and kind of during that time where uh, our most critical um, uh, critical timing of break is is going to happen in a group of pigs. So if we can bridge that gap where they're breaking, that's been the best. It's not a it's not a treatment or rescue um, product. It's it's a, let's prevent E. coli from attaching and creating a, a disease issue. Get it in seven, fourteen, twenty one days ahead of when they're seeing clinical signs. Between seven and fourteen, it doesn't have to be a long duration, but they have to be eating and eating it well before that E. coli challenge exists. The eating is so important, right? If it's in the feed, um, if the pig's not eating, if they're if they're already sick, to your point, um, it doesn't matter what goes in the feed if they're not eating it. Exactly. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boring or Ingelheim representative to learn more. Awesome information, Brad. Very practical. Um, and I think something that many, many producers out in the industry can utilize. Really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing that with our audience. No, again, appreciate the invite and thank you. Yep. Well, uh, to our audience, thank you very much for making this possible. Uh, please like and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Um, if you have not checked out our website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com and take a look at what we've got up there. You'll be able to access not only uh, Brad's presentation, but all the other podcasts we've recorded throughout the years. Uh, for Dr. Brad Lewerke, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to spend this Friday with you. Please have a great rest of your day and join us again next Friday for our next episode. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H E L L O at W I S E N E T. I-X dot com.